Can you All right, it? Travis, I'm gonna take it away. Uh, so I'm not Martin, um, but thank you, Martin, for uh, switching with me. Uh, we switched because uh, I have to set up after this, so um, uh, so we didn't have to run off. Um, but uh, so my talk is about uh, does the radio even matter? Um, and this kind of grew out of a question that was asked at last year's GRCon um, to the panel, where um, you know we have all these. Uh, SDRs out that are, you know, 20 bucks for an RTL um, uh, and a lot of other low-cost devices. And can we just do everything in software? Does, does the radio even matter? Um, and uh, working at a hardware company that actually makes transceivers, that really made me hurt inside. <laughs> um, so hopefully this talk will try to answer that. Uh, uh, but we'll find out. Um, so maybe an easier question, uh, which is cheaper? A, uh, you know, a Keysight MXG signal generator with arbitrary waveform uh, capability, uh, an SMA cable that's half a meter long, or an RTL? How many think an, an RTL is the cheapest here? MXG? Anyone? I heard if you buy a pallet of them, you can get them really cheap. Um, so uh, when, when we bought these, RTL was half the price, basically, of the cable, which is crazy. Um, so we're in this like, really um, interesting world now where uh, RTL, our SDRs are affordable. Um, and because when I started uh, working with these devices, uh, we had the USRP in our classroom, uh, and that device was bolted down to the desk, but the computer wasn't, because it was worth more than the computer. Um, so, you know, uh, ADI just came out with the Pluto device, which is uh, in this realm uh, of low-cost uh, transceivers. Um, but people ask us all the time, you know, why would I buy that over RTL, or say, even an E310 device? Um, and that also morphed into questions that we get about Pluto a lot. Um, questions like, um, you know, what's the receiver sensitivity of the device? Um, and honestly, that has no meaning unless, you know, you have a waveform uh, that's associated with it. Um, so what we wanted to do was uh, provide a, a testing framework that we could show the performance of different SDRs um, from a application type perspective. So, you know, if you take the data sheet that's associated with Pluto, which will basically be the 9363 uh, transceiver on it, it will give you, you know, information like noise factor, which from a comms perspective, which is my background, doesn't really mean much. Um, it's, it's really hard to relate that to a, like an EVM number at the end of the day or a BER number. Like, why do I need, you know, uh, a noise factor of, you know, X dB, is, is that really what I need? Um, and we also wanted to do a testing framework because you know we sell chips and people put them in their own radios and they want to be able to compare them to say like our reference designs or our eval boards uh, like the FMCOMS uh, 2 uh, which is on, uh, on the right here. Um, and also to actually look at uh, the communications perspective of the transceiver. So when customers ask us, you know, I have a spur over here, how do I get rid of that? Or, you know, my EVM is terrible, we could give them some better advice on how to deal with that. Um, so again, the, the purpose of the testing framework that we've been working on uh, is to provide guidance at a communications perspective, not just a hardware, uh, you know, hardcore RF uh, or, trend, or um, you know, data converter uh, type level. Um, and we wanted to be able to compare SDRs easily. Um, and with as little instrumentation, if possible, uh, like we use a lot just because you know, we're ADI and we have access to that stuff. Um, but uh, this testing framework is designed that you can actually connect multiple SDRs if you want to compare them. Um, and so unfortunately, we did this in MATLAB. Uh, I know that uh, that's a sore spot 
in this community sometimes. Um, but the main reason we did that was because we wanted a standards compliant waveform. And uh, I don't know of a way to do that, to generate waveforms and to receive them uh, like WLAN or LTE in uh, GR. Um, and secondly, uh, instrument support. So I was hoping there might be some Skippy blocks uh, that existed in GR, like there's you know, Pi, Visa, uh, and packages like that, but um, uh, nothing you know, ready to go, no out of tree module that will allow you to talk to instrumentation. Uh, so MATLAB kind of has that out of the box, and it has a deep library of uh, uh, measurement uh, tools that we can just use. Um, okay. So a little disclaimer, uh, these conditions are super ideal, like we're using cables to connect to uh, you know, $100,000 worth of test equipment in, in, in some of this stuff. Um, and these plots are n not representative of, you know, they're not a data sheet. So if your part doesn't exactly meet uh, the exact curve that we have, um, uh, it's, it's more of like a, a representative uh, of uh, what you should uh, expect w uh, with a device. Um, so also, um, there's differences between transceivers. So as, as Robin mentioned, um, it's more of like a data capture device and uh, a data transmission device. Um, it's not really a radio. Um, so there are reasons that you know, the uh, E310 costs more. It has filters, which are super important, um, as, as Robin showed with you know, the, um, uh, the harmonic demo that he had yesterday. Uh, and filters are not cheap, especially when your transceiver works from 70 meg to 6 gig. So a lot of the times, they'll cost more than the transceiver. Um, and we have a lot more expertise with programming our stuff. So uh, the data might be, you could say it might be slightly skewed because we know all the knobs to turn uh, to make uh, our device um, perform the best. Um, but we tried our best to um, you know, optimize, uh, uh, particularly RTL, the best that we could. Now, the, the main measurement that we're looking at for our stuff is uh, EVM because it's a good system level measurement. Um, it, it will reflect things like noise factor um, and other disturbances that you'll have uh, along the signal chain. Um, so the idea of the test framework is that you know, we can generate uh, LTE waveforms and pass them through whatever is in the green blocks here. So that could be an instrument or it could be an SDR. Uh, and then we bring data back in uh, raw IQ into uh, MATLAB and decode it. Um, so the framework, you can connect uh, signal generators to SDRs, SDRs to PXAs, um, SDRs to SDRs, signal generators to PXAs. Uh, you know, you can mix, mix and match how you want. Um, and all we really rely on is that uh, you can pull IQ data in and out of them. Now, so this is uh, an example of some of the test equipment we had set up. Um, so we're not, uh, you know, screwing around. Um, uh, this is just a, a couple signal generators uh, and a, um, a data capture PXA. Uh, and so tinfoil shielding is not enough. Um, this is a, a test box that we use. Uh, and because so originally we actually, um, w with our testing, we just did it open in the lab and we had huge spikes at 2.4 uh, and like uh, I believe 5.8, I wonder why. Um, and uh, we, so we, we had this box built, but in the meantime, uh, since it kind of takes time for the shop to build things, uh, we put like a you know, shoe box with tin foil around it, and uh, this will do a lot better. Um, and here's an, a, a picture of it from inside, um, and we have a, a, an E310 uh, setup, um, which is actually being tested now. now. Uh, adding SDRs and instruments is actually really simple in this framework. Um, you just create a class. Uh, yes, MATLAB has classes. A lot of people actually don't know that. Um, and you just have to implement a, a few methods that are basically setting up the device, um, pulling, uh, transmitting data, receive data. Uh, if you only have a received device, um, uh, it, the way the tests are designed is that uh, they just won't call those methods. Um, so we've implemented uh, this for basically all the, the SDRs that um, 
or uh, excuse me, uh, but FM comms, Pluto, and RF SOM based devices. Um, and basically any I.O. device that you have, which is the library we, um, uh, we maintain uh, for, for talking to the SDRs, uh, should work in this framework. Um, and we have uh, uh, implemented this class for uh, the E310 uh, and RTL SDR, um, along with some other instruments. So this actually doesn't necessarily require MATLAB uh, interface, so you don't have to have like a MATLAB you know, function or um, MATLAB system object uh, to add things to the, the in, this infrastructure. Um, we actually ran into an issue with RTL where there was a big memory leak uh, with libUSB, uh, and it would just make our system crash after like a day of testing. Uh, so we had to run things externally and then pull it back into MATLAB. Uh, and test cases are, are super easy to write. Uh, you select a, an, LTE, an LTE configuration. Um, all of these are based off of downlink right now, but we'll be adding uh, uplink testing soon. Um, and you select your source and sinks, so an SDR or an, a piece of equipment. Uh, so here we have a, a Pluto device uh, and a PXA um, uh, from Agilent, uh, and we're sweeping over frequency. Uh, so the tests that we're, we're gonna look at here are, are EVM, but you can, you know, you can there are a lot of knobs to turn in the framework. So you can do gain and frequency, and we're adding IP3 uh, noise factor and um, ACLR type testing as well. Now, so there's a lot of knobs to turn, and that can make the tests uh, explode. Um, so you know, the, uh, you gotta be careful on uh, how many steps you pick, uh, and uh, so the, the tests that we usually do take about over the weekend, like three days. Uh, so um, we can't actually look at everything that we would possibly want to, because things take, take time to test. It takes time to decode an LTE frame uh, in MATLAB. It's, you know, it's not real time. Um, so uh, EVM is actually an interesting uh, metric because um, there, so it's actually, uh, there's this actually unique normalizing effect within it. Um, because, uh, so if you have, say, a QPSK signal, um, the, the, the distance um, that you gain here, which is your, your normalization term, um, will be s smaller than, say, if you have a 16-QAM uh, or 64-QAM uh, constellation. So the, there's a huge benefit of actually using a larger constellation um, with EVM, and you'll get smaller numbers. And we'll show some of that in our testing and how that appears. Um, so how the tests work is you actually do uh, calibration on all the devices initially. Uh, you set up the transmitter, and then you run the receiver over all the settings that apply to that transmitter setting. Um, and uh, you can actually set up calibrations to happen uh, how, often, how, how often you want them to happen. So um, in the Pluto itself, it actually does a uh, calibration every time you uh, change the LO to be um, 100 megahertz off, and we do that every time. Um, so um, we actually, so when we're talking about calibration, uh, besides internal to the part or internal to the instrument itself, uh, we do um, LO calibration. So even like key site equipment, um, like VSA type software, uh, you have to be pretty close for it to lock in and uh, recover data. Um, so we do our best on uh, like the Pluto device has a, has a knob called XO correction where you can actually change the oscillator itself and that will fix both timing and frequency offset. And we do that by just sending test tones. Um, for, so the RTL, when we got it, was actually a little bit interesting. Um, like it has a PPM offset, which I really don't know what it does because um, uh, like it's super, super nonlinear when you change, uh, 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 it, when you increment it. Uh, and we found a lot better results by just uh, modifying the LO. Um, and obviously equipment has like push button cal, so that's a lot, e uh, a lot easier to do. Okay, so let's kind of deep dive into Pluto itself. Um, so these results, uh, you could take them as a receiver sensitivity measurement. Um, so receiver sensitivity is really based off of a, it's typically based off of a packet error rate 
um, number. So like Wi-Fi will say, uh, you know, you have to maintain a 10% packet error rate uh, for you know a certain MCS index. Um, and what our curves are going to try to show is, you know, pick uh, what you want for this configuration to be your sensitivity. Um, and there's a lot of unknowns, and it's going to change the results a lot. So if you're changing the modulation scheme, changing the, the bandwidth, changing the frequency that things operate at, that's actually going to shift the curves around a lot and change your EVM performance. Um, so, you know, we, bu we built a Pluto, and we understand, or we, we think we know uh, how to um, uh, drive it in the correct ways, and how to turn all the knobs in, in, uh, uh, in, in a correct way to, to get ideal performance, or we hope that it's ideal. Um, but an example you can look at is the AGC. So the, the, the AGC has um, for the product itself has um, the chip has like a thousand registers, uh, and the AGC has like um, like a hundred settings you can change in it, and it's super complicated to to actually get right. Um, and we have a Simulink model that will actually model the whole uh, receiver itself, and a lot of customers use that to kind of uh, set up the the receiver in an ideal way uh, for their waveforms. Um, but not but this. Test framework actually gave us a lot of information about, you know, if after settling, is that ideal? Do we get better EVM? Because um, we can actually, you know, look at a system level perspective uh, on, on gain itself. Now, the, the tests we're going to look at uh, are all receiver tests. So they're all downlink uh, based uh, for LTE. Uh, and we're going to look primarily at Pluto, but we'll have some, uh, some graphs on RTL as well. Um, and one thing to note is, so we're using a signal generator to transmit uh, all signals to the Pluto, um, and we're going to vary gain in frequency. And we're also going to set Pluto up in slow attack. So Pluto has uh, fast attack, slow attack, and manual, um, and we're going to just use the default gain table that's in there uh, with no you know, special tweaking or anything like that, um, which should give you a target uh, DVFS of minus 10. So let's talk about measurement perspective first. So these plots are um, EVM uh, over the transmitter gain uh, setting of the signal generator. So and one plot is in percent, and one is in dB. So you can see the sensitivity and how it changes uh, across, uh, uh, across um, uh, EVM. Um, and the bars across each of the plots are actually the LTE spec for the, the transmit EVM uh, requirement. So this kind of gives you an idea on the, um, uh, the level that you should try to maintain to be able to recover that uh, modulation scheme for LTE. Um, so, but for, for perspective, you know, we're at minus like 35 dB, uh, which is actually really good. Um, uh, in, in our opinion, actually, uh, for the receiver. Um, so we actually did some initial testing with just the um, signal generator to the PXA, and um, we were actually able to outdo it <laughs> on certain frequencies, but uh, the PXA will be a lot uh, flatter over frequency. Now, just to give some perspective, uh, so, you know, we we drive, we drive the, uh, the Pluto all the way down to um, uh, minus 100 dB, uh, dBm, sorry, um, w at the source. Uh, so that's around, um, uh, you know, 0 0.01 gigawatts, which is a tiny, tiny amount of power. Um, and to put that in perspective, uh, if you take Voyager, uh, which, you know, is really far away at this point, um, it has a 22-watt uh, uh, transmitter, so it transmits at 42 dB, uh, uh, dBm uh, at, with a 3.7-meter dish. Uh, and from Earth, that shows up at uh, minus 130 uh, dBm. And to get that, you need a huge dish, right? a 70-meter dish. Right? Um, so this just kind of puts in perspective the, the sensitivity uh, of the device. Um, and if you're looking at the other way, it, it, uh, you, got a lot of, you need a lot of tra more transmit game to talk to, to uh, 
um, to Voyager, where, where you're, you're, you're blessed in 20 kilowatts, which is absolutely insane. Yeah. I wish my router was that good. OK. So let's first look at uh, bandwidth modulation. So uh, LTE 1.4, which is uh, 1.4 megahertz, uh, and LTE 10, uh, 10 megahertz, uh, with different modulations, 64 qualm and QPSK. Uh, you'll see that um, so the, you have this um, range extension just because it's an easier modulation scheme to decode, uh, obviously. Um, so you're getting an extra um, you know, th uh, 30 dB uh, of uh, uh, recover uh, recoverable packet area. Um, but what's interesting is uh, at the higher gains, uh, you get this uh, normalization effect coming in that I talked about with EVM. So, 60, so 64 qualm does better uh, with the higher gain, which is it's kind of a weird anomaly, but uh, that, that's, that's the reason why it's happening. Um, so if you uh, just look at LTE 10 alone at 64 qualm, and you shift the frequency from uh, the low end at 100 megahertz and the high end at 5.8, uh, you'll see this actual shift in the EVM curves. Um, so the reason this happens is because the attenuation is actually greater uh, at the higher frequencies. Um, so that's going to you know, uh, allow for the higher gains to not saturate the part uh, at, at those ranges. Um, but it's going to give you, you know, reduced amplification at, at, the, uh, at the lower gains. Now, if we look at EVM over frequency itself uh, at different gains, um, it's completely. Uh, not uh, obvious at all uh, what happens. Um, so there's no pattern that we can discern of uh, as you as you increase as you change gain. So the the top plots here are um, minus minus 20 minus 30 dB, um, and then you just step down to a you know a decreasing curve in EVM over frequency, and um, you know then you then you actually are doing your best at minus 50, and then you get slightly worse at minus 40. So you know you have to take these, this into account. Where what's your received gain um, got to be, and what's uh, what frequency are you operating at, and how you pick this will determine the performance of the part itself. Now, here's a comparison between RTL uh, and uh, Pluto itself. Um, and you'll notice that, so, you know, RTL wasn't designed to receive LTE, right? Uh, and you're, there's an LNA on the front of it, which is the reason why you'll, why you do best at uh, minus 80 dB uh, of, uh, tr of transmit gain. Um, so basically the part is actually saturating uh, in, in these higher gain stages. Um, but you can think of this as a design margin uh, in your algorithm. So uh, if you're you know, implementing a system that can handle you know, X percent of dB, or uh, sorry, X percent of EVM, uh, then uh, that's going to tell you, OK, I, I need to operate in this gain region, and I need to be able to, uh, I can deal with this level of modulation. Um, so if we look at actually the power uh, in the channel at the time, um, so the, these units should be DBFS, but uh, what's interesting is that RTL uh, will try to for the AGC will try to force the gain to be uh, minus one DBFS, um, which I'm guessing is because of DVBT um, is uh, suitable for that, or it's not sensitive to a lot of saturation. Um, but uh, I'm not really sure the design of why uh, the AGC is set up that way. Um, if anyone knows how to, if you can actually tune the AGC in a certain way, rather than just kind of turning it on or off, um, I would be uh, super interested in that. Um, so Pluto itself, as we mentioned before, has a, uh, has a target AGC setting of minus 10 dBFS, and it's actually hitting that quite nicely uh, with, uh, with enough gain. So Pluto doesn't have an LNA on the front of it, um, so it really has limited gain. Um, as Robin mentioned, you know it's uh, uh, it's a learning tool, um, and it but it's not a complete radio. 
So uh, it's, it's good for students, um, but you know, if it's not something you would want to deploy, uh, per se, because you'll, you know, y it will always violate a mask because it has no transit filters or receive filters. Okay. So if we zoom in a little bit at the end, uh, you'll notice that RTL actually has a better sensitivity uh, than, um, than Pluto, uh, and this is mainly because it has uh, an LNA on the front of it. Uh, but it's only about um, uh, 3 dB. Okay, so you know, does the radio matter? It really depends on what you're doing. So if you need a lot of gain margin, you know, in, uh, if you need a lot of margin in your, uh, uh, in your system, then you might need a more expensive radio, right? But if you're doing, you know, FM, you don't need to spend $10,000 on a radio. Um, but, uh, you know, the, at the end of the day, it's gonna give you that additional margin in your system. So it might not always be necessary. So that's gonna determine, you know, what radio you should purchase. Um, so this test framework that we've been working on, we'll be releasing it and we'll be releasing the results uh, so people can test their own stuff. Uh, and we're testing the E310 right now. Um, if you want us to test your radio, send it to us. Um, we'll test it when we have time. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, I would love to see uh, you know how uh, how HackRF uh, and some of the other solutions uh, uh, compare as well. Um, and one thing is, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we found tons of bugs doing this. When you when you run sixteen thousand you know uh, LTE frames through uh, your system, th that takes like three days. You find a lot of bugs, um, especially in LibUSB on Windows. Uh, and even in the Keystrike Instruments, uh, we found an interesting bug. Um, so, you know, nobody's software is perfect. Um, and we actually improved some of our, our own software, mostly on the API side, uh, to, uh, to make things easier. Uh, but uh, thank you. Thank you, Travis. And I think we have time for one question while Martin uh, comes in. Yeah, right here. Where's, sorry, I'm looking for Martin. Where, okay, well, okay, here we go. It's a quick question. Uh, I saw in one of the uh, graphs, uh, you compare uh, different uh, modulation schemes that uh, packet error rate was bigger for QPSK than for 64 QAM. I don't know why is that it's supposed um, to be reverse. Well, so um, the, uh, if you look, so the, the scales might have been shifted on the bottom. So what will happen from our results is that um, Packet error rate is super sudden with 64 qualm. So it will just happen and uh, how the test would run is that if you received zero packet error rate, or sorry, uh, like 100% error in your packets, then we stop the test. So that's why you won't see any bars on that plot. But uh, the, uh, you know, QPSK is a little bit more resilient. So you would get to the point where it would slowly, uh, the packet error rate would slowly increase. Um, but we, yeah, with 64 qualm, it's kind of super sudden. Uh, we would have to have maybe like smaller gain steps to see that ramp up. Thank you very much, Travis. <laughs> I want to point out Analog Devices is a platinum sponsor of the conference, and this is the last day of the expo. So if you have questions,